okay so without further ado i will kick off so yeah hi everyone um my name's holly i'm one of the co-chairs of the new uh young fabians lgbtqia plus advocacy group um this year we are having a whole um series of events but a large theme of it is going to be focused around lgbt plus health um, we'll be doing a pamphlet on that later in the year so this is a really nice event to kind of kick off kick off that series um, and we're going to be covering probably quite a, right, a wide range of topics um, looking at you know how far we've come the situation today and what still needs to be improved in the future um, we've got a fab panel as, as has been said. Um, the first panellist I'm sure needs no introduction in this group, Dame Angela Eagle MP. Um, we're really, really grateful to have you. Thank you very much. Um, and then we've also got Dr. Sho Ali, who is the secretary of the uh, Young Fabians Health Network and an NHS doctor. Um, we've got Pedro Lino, who is a, a counsellor and an HIV prevention outreach worker. And last but not least, we've got Phil Samba, um, who is uh, also works in HIV prevention and is a health promotion campaigner. Um, so as I said, I'll go to probably Dame Angela first, just with a kind of general question about where we are in terms of the state of LGBT plus health, but also what kind of 10 years of Tory rule has done to our health system and the impact on LGBT people. Thank you. Thank you very much and thank you to the young Fabians and Holly, you for organising this and all your tech people in the background who are working away to make sure that the webinar uh, works. It's a pleasure to be here. I think you've um, you've picked on a very important subject and um, looking at your panel, I am clearly a generalist uh, in these areas since you've got lots of practitioners uh, in the LGBT health field who'll be able to have a much more hands-on um, sort of view about what is actually going on on the ground than I can have by definition. But I, I think uh, the first thing to say is that uh, we have made great strides in terms of getting LGBT people uh, noticed and getting some of their needs uh, to begin to be provided for, obviously and noticeably in uh, HIV AIDS treatment and prevention, which has come on uh, in leaps and bounds since when I was uh, first active in politics in the 1980s. Um, but I think that there are still some things, despite the shift to uh, a much more open LGBT um, presence in our societies uh, and, and some of the work on acceptance and respect and equal treatment that um, many of us have been involved in uh, since um, the 1980s and before. I think that there are some themes that are still there. So for example, um, one in seven LGBT people, according to um, some work that's been done on LGBT uh, health equalities, uh, avoid seeking health care for fear of discrimination. Um, there's a view also that because LGBT uh, issues haven't been mainstreamed, that uh, specialist services are important so that you can deal uh, more holistically with the, the issues that LGBT people have when they access um, health uh, care services. Uh, uh, but a lot of those have come under great financial strain and pressure and many have disappeared in the last 10 years of austerity. Um, so there are issues about uh, that. We know that the extra pressure and, and sometimes shame and fight with acceptance um, and their own um, self-worth that LGBT people can suffer if they've been bullied or they've had difficult times coming to terms with their own sexual orientation and they've had bad experiences either in the family or in their peer group can cause extra stress and pressures. It can cause uh, mental health pressures. Uh, which can then obviously also lead to issues such as um, uh, drug and alcohol misuse, isolation, social isolation, feeling suicidal. And we know that the rates uh, of all of those things are higher uh, in LGBT communities. And we know also that trans, trans people are particularly suffer um, from that at the moment and are bearing the brunt of um, 
a huge uh, uh, sort of organized attempt to ridicule and undermine them in the uh, mainstream press. You can hardly open uh, a newspaper these days without um, seeing stuff that is reminiscent of what I used to routinely see um, in the 1980s when I was uh, growing up. So there are all these issues. Um, we can talk about particular um, aspects of them, um, but uh, from my point of view as someone who's fought for LGBT uh, rights, those rights extend to having access to uh, the specialist healthcare treatment that's needed, uh, to mainstream LGBT uh, uh, needs, um, not to be belittled or um, or treated differently because of your sexual orientation when you try to access healthcare. Uh, all of that still hasn't, I think, been resolved satisfactorily. And there's constant pressure, which um, makes, in some areas, particularly when you've got cuts, things go backwards rather than forward. So I'll leave it there because uh, I don't want to take up uh, all the time. I wonder whether the other panellists have had a similar um, view at the cold face of some of the pressures that services are under. Yeah, thank you. That leads perfectly into what I was going to move on to next. Um, yeah, I'm going to come to Dr. Show next. Um, as Angela was saying, um, yeah, what's your impression as a practitioner on the front line? And if you can take us through some of the more um, health health kind of aspects of what specifically uh, we've we've heard some some things, but what other things LGBT people are facing. Yeah, hi, I'm Shahid Ali. I'm Young Fabian's Health Network Secretary. And firstly, thank you everybody to agreeing to take part in this event. It, it's really exciting and it's 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 really good to have these discussions because this is the left is the only space really where we can have these discussions. Um so um when I'm thinking when I when I was sitting down and trying to think about what would be the health issues facing the LGBT LGBT community. I was. I thought, what would happen if a GP practice only served the LGBT community, and what would come through the door? Um, we can see that in, um, in gun clinics, when and what comes through the door in terms of you can break it down to two distinct points. Really, you can break it down to infectious diseases, communicable diseases like HIV, gonorrhea, syphilis, but also now emerging more non-communicable diseases such as mental health, drug abuse, substance abuse. Um, and fertility issues and all of these really link together really link together in different ways so what why is someone more at risk of getting hiv is it because of their gender is it because of their socioeconomic status or is it because of um, being rejected from their family leading them to leaving them to seek money in other ways all of these relate to a more if you zoom out and have a look at the wider picture it all links into um, what, why are people more at risk? Why are LGBT people more at risk? Is it because of their sex? Is it because of what they try and do of their sex? Or is it because of the pressure being pressure of growing up in a society that is straight? Um, I think um, Alex from Years and Years had a really, um, had a recent documentary on the BBC um, looking into mental health of LGBT, LGBT youth. And he said, no one is unscathed growing up LGBT. And I think health is one of the main issues with this and it links to everything of what it means to be LGBT in the UK and how it affects you. And I'm sure um, the other panel members, actually Phil Samba and Pedro, um, have, are doing great work um, in um, the LGBT spaces um, talking to people on the ground. Yeah. yeah, no, sorry, I was classic 2020, I was unmuting. 2021. Um, so I'm going to come to Pedro next because we focus quite a lot on mental health and I know you're a, a mental health practitioner um, and an HIV out outreach worker so kind of what's your experiences in the area um, and also can you tell us a little bit about what your organisation does because I think you and Phil are both doing really exciting things in the space. Yeah we we at Love Tank uh, we have a projects related to mainly the community that they have men have had sex with men and I was called to do outreach work, especially with the community called BAME, which is a broad term because there are lots of different people in, that fits in this group, you know. And, 
and what I've been finding during this outreach, we do doing all the, the work we've been doing is online right now. We're using dating apps to reach to, to our communities. And it's been quite uh, interesting how, how good is the response. But what I sense is um, loneliness and, and fear. There are lots of people still wondering how, uh, how HIV is transmitted. If they have oral sex, would they catch HIV through it? I have people ask me what syphilis was, you know. So there are lots of um, people who doesn't have the information. Or the, or the issue that I faced recently uh, was a language barrier. I, I reached out for, for someone and this person said, oh, if you were able to speak my language, it would be much easier for me to get help. And it, and it's really, to me, as an outreach work, it's really frustrating because when I can't reach out to someone, when I can't give the support that I like to give, when I can't give the information that this person is willing to receive, it's, it's, very, it's very disappointing. So when it comes to when it comes to what the sense I've been having, the mental health uh, things that I've been perceiving uh, is is that feeling of well I'm really anxious. What do I do? I really want to have sex, but I'm really anxious. I'm really worried, and that to me is a lack of information. You know, I'm still a counselor student. I haven't uh, finished my my degree yet. My college. But, but yes, uh, I've, I was able to, to, to perceive that. And it's upsetting, yeah. Yeah, definitely, thank you. And then um, kind of leading on from all of this, coming last but not least to Phil, um, to speak about your experiences as a, as a campaigner in the area, kind of focusing on HIV. Um, and maybe also, you know, Dame Angela referenced this in the beginning, um, recognizing that we have come far already but what kind of strides do we still need to make and what where are still the the catch points I suppose where it's becoming more difficult to tackle tackle the problem um I think we've come a massive massive way in terms of um I guess somewhat prioritizing LGBT health considering how things were in the 80s or in the, the early 90s but I think one thing that definitely needs to change is um we need more funding like for, for us to be able to do the work that we do that is specifically targeted amongst groups that are disproportionately affected by things like poor sexual health or HIV or mental health or um, other, other, other like health issues that disproportionate, disproportionately affect people from queer communities. I think it's incredibly important to make sure that that, that work is funded. Um, I feel like uh, there's been massive, massive cuts to public health funding in the last 10 years and um we're just seeing we're seeing more and more of that where we should be funded more to benefit the people from these communities health yeah definitely um i just want to pick up on um the question that's come into the chat from sohail um which is if i can just find it again oh gosh i've lost it Sorry, it was basically a question around. Um... I've got it. Oh, um, you've got I, it. I'll Fab. read out it, it for everybody. It says it's well documented that the T in LGBT is often ignored. Obviously, that's trans people we're talking about, uh, and a group uh, that are under attack consistently and have poor health outcomes. Uh, what can we as activists do to, uh, to act in real solidarity with trans people and help improve the health of trans folks across the country? That's what the um, question in the Q&A is asking. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, I've managed to find, find my chat now. Um, so yeah, I want to come to that. I'm really glad that that's been raised so early on. Um, and I want to kind of come to that question now because I think it is really, really important. Um, speaking about sort of one of the most marginalized groups within our community. Um, I'll leave that open for anyone that wants to kind of jump in because I think that all of you could, yep, go for it. <laughs> Angela. <laughs> I read the question and then answer it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, we have to show solidarity. We have to um, realise what's going on, that somehow there are those people who aren't in favour of progressive advance um, for LGBT people who want to turn parts of the community against parts of 
uh, other communities. So classically, what they're trying to do is start culture wars between feminists and trans people, where in fact, um, everybody is subjected to the same sorts of um, attacks from people who worry that progressive advance will mean the end of society. We've all, we've all come across people that think that if um, this, uh, that my right to um, have a civil partnership or, or get married will somehow ruin a heterosexual marriage. I mean, it is ridiculous. Um, and we know that uh, we create better, fairer, societies more at ease with themselves if we can lead to us ourselves to a situation where LGBT um, rights are just taken for granted and so we must resist first and foremost the attempts to divide us between um, uh, lesbians and trans people there seems to be a lot of worry about trans women rather than trans men and and it's very familiar to what I experienced in the 1980s it's all about toilets um, there was quite a lot of anti-gay stuff in the 1980s that was all about toilets. It's all about people's fears. Um, and what we need to do is not fall for the divide and rule tactic and realise that we've got to show solidarity across the piece. That if um, that it's possible, as I say, to be um, a, a, a lesbian and a feminist and a trans ally and a proud trans ally, and that's how we have to behave. Yeah, completely, completely agree. As another um, cis LGBT feminist, I agree. I find the attacks so they claim to speak for me and they don't put it that way. Um, I'm going to come to show now if you could speak maybe about the impact that some of that has on trans healthcare um, in terms of gender identity clinics, but also more widely um, the, the specific health issues that trans people face. Yeah, um, I think um when talking about trans rights we need to know where we came from um, um i watch a lot of uk drag race and see if we said in the meet a korean to know where we're going we need to know where we came from and i think it's so important every attack on an lgbt lgbt person is also attack on theirs because this is the playbook the toys have used throughout the whole time they've ever been in power they attack a marginalized group and once they win they'll just expand that attack to somebody else, whether it's you, whether you're black, whether you're a woman, whether you're trans, they just target marginalized groups and use that to feed into fear. You can see that in how they won the Brexit campaign, the fear of migrants, they're now using trans, uh, trans rights for fear of trans to win them votes and win people's votes. I think it's really important every time it comes up, we say no and we say why. Um, because it's very, I, I'm brown, I'm gay, I'm Muslim. I didn't decide one day to wake up and be this. It just happens. And a trans person doesn't wake up and decide to be trans. It just happens. You are trans. And I think it's important to realise you could be in that position as well. And what would you do if you were there? You, you'd want someone to help you. Um, and Stonewall have done really good work into looking into trans health and the issues facing it. Their report in 2018 um, showed, um, um, looked into why, what issues are facing trans healthcare. Um, the main issues were waiting time, 47% said that the main issue to accessing care was the wait for care, whether that be in um, accessing the gender identity clinic or even the GP, just accessing care is really important. The second was money, the third was the fear of rejection from their family, and the fourth was um, the fear of rejection from professional. Um, when we talk about trans rights, it's important that we all don't just talk healthcare, we don't just talk about um, gender, um, hormones or gender identity clinics. There's other stuff in trans healthcare that gets ignored, whether that's gender affirming surgery, mental health support, or they're just other um, trans, trans healthcare, whether that be um, attending screening programs for um, for cancers, or just getting the rest of your rest of um, rest of your health checked. Other conditions happen just because you're trans. You can get cancer, you can break your arm, and just accessing these services is harder for trans people. Don't use your pronouns, and the medical professional, like like a lot of society, can be transphobic. These debates that are happening here are also happening in the medical prof profession. And the medical profession, especially the older generation, 
are more white, the more right leaning, and they share similar views that are happening in the debates we see in the see in the BBC, and we see in the right right leaning spaces. So it's important we hear them, we call it out, and say why it's wrong. Yeah, Phil, I'm not going to say anything, Phil. Sorry, um, I also think that um, in uh, I guess in a more proactive sense, it's kind of when it's kind. Of, like trying to follow the narrative of what's happening with with trans people or with trans help. Like for example, at the moment, I think there's um there's a consultation at the minute. Um, or I don't know if it, I I'm I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong. I think there's uh, again, as um, Angela was saying, there's an issue again with toilets and um, it's it's just odd that like I don't know the Conservative Party can say all this stuff being in solidarity or support of queer people, but then they turn around and then try to stop trans people from using different bathrooms and stuff like that. And I think it's also about making sure that we we follow these stories and that we're, they're not forgotten. I feel like a lot of the time in the LGBT community, um, I, I find that like it can be extremely divisive and that instead of us being united about the things that make us different, we try to say we don't belong in that group so we belong in this group and we're not going to care about the other person's issue and I think the importance of being an ally is to 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 support other people and to support other groups and support support them in trying to help them to kind of I don't know if if we have privilege if we have any sort of power then we should use that to to benefit other groups yeah um I also think that I don't that what, what would be interesting is to give voice for them, let them use their voice to speak for themselves as well and give them the space. As Phil was saying, there's a, a short of funding. And I think it's really important to fund trans ideas and projects and to let them create their own, uh, empower the, the whole community, but especially the ones that are in the fringe that, that, that don't have their voices. Uh, heard enough, you know, to participate in every sort of events, to be, to be with with us, you know, everywhere, and to be able to create their own projects. Because, um, uh, what is the best way for me, for example, migrant men, to 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 help the migrant community? You know, is to create, you know, my 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 own way towards it and I think that giving the support for these people and using our privilege to, to, to open doors for these people to create their own services and th their own way to be seen is, is also very important. Mm -hmm. Yeah um, I've put the consultation that Phil referred to in the chat um, it is really important actually so everyone who's watching tonight or later when it goes up on uh, Facebook or whatever, um, do respond to that consultation because it's another example of the Tories rowing back on what they said they would do. They said they would reform the Gender Recognition Act and then have decided not to, even though the consultation came out positive. Um, <clears throat> so do take a look at that and um, yeah, and thanks for raising everyone. Um, we've got a question in the Q&A box about representation of trans people in healthcare and in politics, which I think is really, really important. Um, so yes, I think we'll go probably to show an Angela on this one in terms of increasing trans and LGBT representation in the sector and what that could do for healthcare outcomes. Well, uh, again, we, we just have to recognise the pressure that the trans community is under. I think we have to recognise that in the last few years there's been um, a great increase in visibility of trans people uh, and uh, that's what's caused the backlash and the um, fear-mongering apart from um, those who are deliberately provoking it uh, in the way in which they did against LGB uh, people in the 80s for political purposes as has already been pointed out and so I think the key thing is to ensure that there are safe spaces for trans people to um, to express uh, their experiences and develop the a series of demands that they feel um, would lead to better sort of acceptance and integration in society. I think that there's general um, move as well if you look at the non-binary issue and the just general um, sort of shifts that they've been in that whole area far more uh, far less rigid um, gender 
uh, roles and and stereotyping uh, that we've got um, in our society now than we had when I was growing up, which is a very long time ago. We don't need to go into how far back in history that was. But um, I do think that um, when these things happen, certain people who like their um, their, their role in societies and their genders and their sex um, based approaches to life panic a bit and that's what we're seeing now with the backlash. Um, it, it, there are people who just haven't come across this kind of thing before uh, that we need to um, inform and be patient with but there are those that are hate mongering uh, that we don't need to be patient with and you usually know what's going on when you come across it. Yeah agreed. So I want to ask about um, LGBT experiences in like working in the health sector, um, trans uh, as included obviously. Um, we've seen obviously in the last couple of weeks there's been some sort of faux moral outrage about certain language advice and it probably is not a very pleasant place for some trans people to work sometimes because of because of that um, but also what's your experience been like as an LGBT uh, NHS worker and what's the NHS doing to kind of make it a more inclusive environment? Um, yeah um, Stone have done really good work work researching looking into being out at work being out at work is an issue for everybody no matter what profession you're in whether you're a doctor whether you work in an office you're a construction worker and it really depends what your atmosphere at work is like and being out at work is a quite a powerful statement being lgbt being out being lgbt one of the things i struggled with is always having to come out whether that be to your friends family work and being comfortable in those spaces especially if you rotate a lot and um, there's been really good work in terms of having an um, NHS rainbow badge um, by GLADS to be out at work um, so you can be out um, in an easy way on your lanyard but also it helps you connect with patients as well. I think having advocates and seeing seeing yourself represented is so important. Um, medical The medical schools have worked really really hard to make sure that the people they're letting in represent society because that's what you want who are treating you. You want to see a representation of society. Um, medical school now has a six percent intake of female. It's my year. Most people were BME, which represents so the way society is um, more multicultural, whereas before the, the doctor, if you think of a doctor in your head, was a white, cis, straight male. That's not happening anymore. People, doctors are now reflecting society, and with that, it reflects a more wider spectrum of LGBT people, not gender non conforming people. Making these safe spaces safe is important but I think we've made loads, loads of progress and I think um, it's important to build on what's happened in the past like I looked at Dame Angela and her coming out and her story and it gives me faith into knowing I might do something and um, to, I might be a role model for someone else who's coming in and I think that's um, like gives me a lot of faith and strength going forward. Dr Show Ali MP in the future. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> um, I could see Phil kind of nodding away as you were talking. Um, what's kind of in, in, well, actually Phil and Pedro both, um, in your roles as outreach, outreach workers, what is the importance of that of that role model for people to be able to, to connect to? You've spoken a bit about language barriers and things like that, but what about the role model and the visibility kind of side? Um, well, I think um, if you don't see yourself within messaging, like within healthcare, then you're not going to identify with it. You're not going to relate to it. You're not going to respond to it. You're not going to think that message isn't for me because I'm not. I don't see myself within it. And I, I think that's the first thing. The first thing is that if, if we're not actually represented well within the messaging, then we're not going to respond to it. I also feel that like it's, it's more than that though. It's more than just having hypothetically people of color in front of a camera behind that camera. Like you know, it's it's about being involved with the, the campaigns and the messaging and the development of these programs. And I think if you have that from the very beginning and like you, you like build it up, I think those things end up being more responsive and uh, communities respond to that because it's more authentic. And I think sometimes some um, healthcare professionals can struggle to, can struggle to like 
I don't know, uh, connect with certain communities. And um, I, I hate this whole aspect of um, certain people are hard to reach. And there's no such thing as um, hard to reach people. It's just the services are hard to reach. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. And I also have a sense that you're talking about community, Phil, and how it's, uh, in my experience, it was important to have the community to give me the sense of belonging and once I felt like I belonged, that I saw myself in, in those spaces, not myself, but my community in those spaces, I was able to see myself as well in those spaces. And then I was able to, to, to have the self-value to, to give me the sense that I deserve the treatment. Because I also feel, not the treatment, but the services. And I, and I feel like the, that, that there is an important thing when you see yourself not your community in those spaces, it creates a trust relationship, mm. you know? And, and I don't think the care is possible without trust. You need to trust to be taken care of. So I think that is, is very important to create uh, in the future, this sense of belonging and this sense that of trust, that, that you can trust yourself in a service that is foreign literally to you. Can I just yeah. say something about being being out at work? Because obviously it's not always um, the case that when you come out at work, you're on the front page of the Daily Mail and and and, um, and the independent who did my coming out story for me uh, and Suzanne Moore, who um, is a great journalist who also um, did that uh, for me. Um, that is part of it. I think that kind of representation and being open and proud and out, if it's possible to do, is a very powerful statement. But uh, when I first went into Parliament in 1992, there were only 60 women out of 650 MPs. It's a bit better than that now. There were no out lesbians and there'd only ever been one out lesbian before and she had been deselected outed by a gossip columnist in the Daily Mail in the most outrageous circumstances, baited and ridiculed, deselected, uh, and then uh, lost her seat. And that was Maureen Colvin who died last week. Um, you, she, she was the first out uh, lesbian and that, and that was the only example of someone else that I knew about. But I think times had changed and, and I knew that um, if my coming out had to lead to my losing my seat, then that would just have to be the price that was paid. Um, all of us stand on the shoulders of people who've sacrificed before us, whether it's to um, get more women in parliament or to get uh, representation of LGBT uh, people in parliament, we still have to have our first trans uh, member of parliament, although there are trans members in other countries. Um, so there's progress being made, but there's nothing that beats representation. However, I don't think that we should put the pressure on individuals to come out at work. It's sometimes not possible. Everyone has their own individual circumstance. And I remember having a discussion with the, um, with the, um, uh, the uh, football leagues who were uh, wanting to think how um, they might deal with an LGBT person who came out in football and they were saying well we can't we can't stop you know um, anti-gay chants because there's no role models and it's like it's not about asking someone to come out as gay so that they can get um, horrible ch chance at them every time they run a on a on a football field or you know lose all their endorsements like Billie Jean King did when she was um forced out in the way that she was overnight literally um you know we've got to create more welcoming environments we've got to um ensure that people have rights at work that are properly enforceable and that there are atmospheres at work where people can feel supported uh, and confident enough to be themselves in that way and obviously the NHS is uh, got the largest workforce in the country and so in many ways it has a particular duty um, to make sure it gets this right. Yeah I completely agree. Um, I'm so glad that you brought up 
Maureen Colhoun, I don't think her story is anywhere near known enough. Um, I I knew a bit about her before last week, but I've obviously done a lot more research since. And I'm, I'm actually kind of ashamed that I didn't know uh, very much before. Um, yeah, I'm going to do a quick plug. We, we are actually hosting an event next week on Maureen's story um, with, uh, yeah, our women's officer um, and a historian from the History of Parliament project. So I'll pop the link in the chat for attendees who might like to attend that as well, because, yeah, I completely agree. It's a really, really important story. Um, and it's, yeah, as I say, I'm, I'm quite, I, yeah, I feel quite ashamed that I didn't know uh, enough about it beforehand. Um, but I think that what you were just saying, Angela, leads quite nicely into Carla's question um, in the Q&A box, which is in terms of the damage caused by a straight society on LGBTQIA plus mental and physical health outcomes. When do you think we will reach that point of not coming out or kind of a non default straight society? And what impact do you think that this could have on the health of our community? Um, and given that you were speaking about it, I'll go first to you, Angela. Well, I mean, I, I think it would be fantastic um, if we got to a stage in our society where people like me didn't have to give front page newspaper <laughs> interviews to declare uh, that they were uh, that they that they were a lesbian. Um, but um, we will only make that progress when people stop worrying so much about what those things are. And where things are, and where what were previously very rigid um, boundaries and expectations of men and women, and boys and girls, uh, and anything in between, have uh, 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 um, sort of become less rigid. And I think that would actually lead to a society where there was a lot less stress and pressure, um, where we saw a lot less gender stereotyping where people could grow up to be much more themselves rather than have to fit into very old fashioned and reactionary views of what women or men should be doing, which as we know, change over time, mainly as a result of campaigning for progressive change. So we will get to a stage where that is the case. We've made far more progress during my time in parliament than I ever thought would be possible. We now um, boast the gayest parliament in the world. Well, I would not have believed you if you'd have told me when I went into um, the House of Commons in 1992 that we would be in this situation a mere 29 years later. So I think, um, you know, change can come, but it always has to be organised. It doesn't happen by accident. <laughs> it happens because of the dedication and um, and um, fearlessness of those that are supporting progressive change. The NHS didn't come about as an inevitability. It came about because the Labour government created it in the teeth of massive, massive opposition. And so you have to go through that sort of campaigning barrier of making your case to uh, the great British public and usually have to wade through massive levels of misrepresentation and propaganda in some of the red top um, tabloids uh, and any LGBT person knows all about that uh, and you've just got to persist and so I think we will get to that stage um, and it might be faster than we think but just as you can go forwards you can all always go backwards there is always backlash by the forces that don't want these things to change. And mm. it's usually a sign that you've made great progress, which has worried them a lot when the backlash grows. And so I see that kind of backlash um, as a danger, but also it's um, a representation of how far we've come and how quickly. Completely agree. Um, I wanna come to Phil as a, as a health promotion campaigner and someone who was also instrumental in campaigning around access to PrEP um, in the UK. If you could, yeah, um, what's the state of PrEP campaigning at the moment? And do you think that we are still making forward strides in the face of this opposition that, that Angela's spoken about? Um, so I, I kind of want to follow on from what Angela was saying as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, the other thing to consider is religion. And I, I'm in no way against religion, but um, um, many of us can relate to growing up in like religious families and like having this belief that being queer was wrong and like that is kind of how a lot of I guess straight society has been 
bestowed onto us. And like when we were younger, all the the like husbands and wives that we saw on TV, and like having things like you know as a child believing that you're going to like marry the opposite sex and have children and all of that stuff. So I think that is always imposed on us, and I think that that's maybe something that um, straight people don't realize. Yeah. Um, as for prep, um, it's a tricky one actually because we now have prep available on the NHS. So um, PrEP is a drug you take before and after sex that stops you from getting HIV. Um, but like, it's now available on the NHS, but there's still a lot of issues in terms of uptake. There's still a lot of people that don't believe that it works. There's still a lot of people from different um, different um, groups that um, don't know that, it ex like you don't, don't literally know anything about it. And I think there needs to be more work. I think ju just because we have access to it, doesn't mean that the government is actually doing enough to promote those messages. I think um, there was a disservice in it in originally being in this country as a trial, because um, I think people thought that it didn't work and that the trial was to see that if it worked, where it was actually to see uh. how many people are gonna use it, how, many, how long they were gonna use it and which way they would use it, how they would take it. And it's only last year that we've actually gotten routine commissioning there's a lot of issues with that because um, there are a lot of, there's basically, there's a brand new service and there's no staff to, there's no new staff to, to do this work. So there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of more work to be done. Basically we've, we've done some of the battle, but if you think about it internationally, like PrEP is not available in other countries. And the reason why, part of the reason why I got into uh, working in HIV and sexual health was because if, if this country, well, I guess we have it now. If England didn't have a prep service, then how do we expect um, other countries to do it if we're supposed to be leading in terms of things like health with the NHS? Yeah, completely. Um, I just want to stick with you, but pick up on Stephen's question in the chat, which is um, kind of what needs to be the biggest policy change in the next 10 to 20 years um, in terms of reducing HIV rates even further in the LGBT community, but also in other communities that uh, have a high prevalence of, of HIV um, and kind of how can you know what campaigning needs to happen what policy changes need to happen to get us to to get us to that place Oof, that's a big question <laughs> <laughs> um, there's, there's many 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 different things I think um, one issue that we have within HIV and sexual health is that we tend to do things separately like we have testing in one place and then we have prep somewhere else and then we have HIV medication somewhere else and I think that Everything needs to be as one. I think we need to do combination prevention because that way um, those messages are kind of reiterated to everyone. Um, again, with funding, funding is a massive, massive issue with this. And I feel like um, sometimes it's not prioritized. I feel like sometimes LGBT health in general is not prioritized or funding is not prioritized. So that's kind of like, that's my answer. It is a good one, thank you. <laughs> um, I'm just gonna come to show now to pick up on what we've been talking about in terms of HIV AIDS, but also uh, a question in the Q&A box about data collection and the importance of data in the NHS to really understand your patient populations. Um, and it specifically says that trans status isn't properly recorded. Uh, so what can we do about that? Um, I think, um, what we can learn from the hate, one of the best things about being LGBT is looking at the impact that the HIV movement has. It went from a condition where no one cared about it, people were dying, and the government didn't do anything. Um, you've got lights of ACT UP saying silence equals death, and um, you, you saw this very grassroots movement causing people to have change. It didn't come about where people were sitting there doing nothing. People went out in the streets, they campaigned, they went onto the Wall Street in the UK, they set up protests, they did anything they could to make their voices heard because the people in power weren't listening to them because they didn't care. And I think the trans movement also needs to do the same. If people aren't listening to you, they aren't collecting the data that you want, collect it yourself. You can go out there, set up studies, you can make those changes visible and you can do it. Um, it's just accessing those spaces and knowing who to turn to to go out and do this. And there's been recent debates in Scotland about um, how they're collecting their census data and their views on what if they should collect gender, sex and stuff. And I think it's important for everybody, if, if the data isn't being collected, collect it 
go and collect it yourself because then no one's going to be invest invested in a topic more than you are if it's a thing you want to do. This is why I'm interested in health and LGBT policy because it affects me. If it affects you, go out and do it. And I think you, you're your best advocate in those spaces when people are saying, should we do this? Should we not do that? They're not going to advocate for a group they don't know about, they don't interact with, they're not friends with. They're not going to care about them. And these spaces will be shut to you if you keep on not trying to access them. So making sure you try and go out there and just be a strong voice like um, Phil, um, he's out there making really loud noises for career prep of colour and getting access for um, prep for career men of colour who aren't accessing these, accessing these services that are there. So just go out there and do what I think is the best. best to do it, I think. I think that's easier said than done. Um, I think we've got to be careful not to put the blame on a group's invisibility on the group itself, especially because quite often the groups that are under the most pressure feel the most marginalised. I think trans people are, um, are in that place now. And I don't think it's, uh, and I understand what um, Sharab is saying, um, but if you look at what happened in the 1980s with LGBT rights activists, an awful lot of people died. <laughs> Um, you know, mm -hmm. 34 million people have died of AIDS um, in, in, in the times since it was first identified in that manner. And although we now, thank goodness, have um, uh, drugs which keep it uh, from being uh, as deadly and which keep it from transmitting, an awful lot of very tragic things have happened before um, the very inspiring story of, of how LGBT people fought uh, to get the recognition that, that they deserved of this disease. Um, so I think that we've got to be looking to have a situation where our NHS does this work because the people that it's serving are, are all the community, not people who are um, who are marginalised and the NHS can't be the NHS if it doesn't include all marginalised people. So yes I understand campaign but if you're marginalised by definition it's sometimes difficult for you to do things like that. Um, mm -hmm. So we've got to empower um, our public services to um, realise and many of them do that they've got to be not only representative of the communities that they serve, but also open to all. I mean, that's in what our democracy needs to do. And that's why it's really important to mainstream services, um, as well as, as um, sort of say, well, we'll respond to people who campaign, but if we can't hear your voice, we're not gonna respond. We've got to be more proactive than that, I think. Um, I, I also think one of the, biggest risk for LGBT health is how it's become siloed into separate issues. We have PrEP, we have gun clinics, now we have access to um, um, hormones. Like they're all the same issue. We're all one big family trying to get the same thing. And I think this divide and conquer rule of how the health system is set up and now how the government are trying to pick on one group um, to target this is, is a deliberate strategy to divide us. And I think every time we go into a space, we need to remember I'm who I am, but also who got me here in terms of that trans voice who shouted and did stuff in the protest and how, how I'm going to advocate for them in this space if someone attacks them. And I think in health, lots of conditions happen in silos and it's important we try and link them together and make a more powerful statement because so, they all, they're all the same issue, trying to fight for fight for their voice in a big crowd. Yeah, agreed. And I was going to say, I think on the on the sort of data and the campaigning point, that's a really strong message for us cis allies as well um, to be getting out there and, and supporting, not taking the forefront, obviously, but supporting those movements and providing, yeah, providing that outward allyship and those those voices in support. Um, I want to come back to Angela. Uh, we're probably going to wrap up around eight, maybe just after, um, if that's all right with everybody. But um, Angela, you've spoken a lot about you know, your experiences in the 80s. And I think those of us who have the privilege of being a cis LGBT person now maybe weren't so aware of it 
It's a Sin has obviously been a huge cultural phenomenon in the last month or so. I'll confess I haven't had the sort of mental health wherewithal to finish it, um, but I will. I will get there. I will get there soon. Um, but I wonder, you know, what's the importance? I think I know what the answer is going to be, but what's the importance of telling those stories to make sure that we don't we don't forget, as, as everyone has said, you know, that we do stand on the shoulders of people who've gone before? It's absolutely crucial that people understand the history of uh, the rights, the civil rights movements that brought us equal rights uh, and where we started off from a period where um, it was illegal to be gay and let's face it in many areas of the world, I think 60 countries in the world it's still um, illegal to be gay and you can actually be subjected to capital punishment for being gay in certain places and so we've got a lot more campaigning to do around the world to deal with um, all of that and I think understanding the story of how we came uh, to be in the position we're in now where we came from means that we won't forget that things I, I always keep saying this things can go backwards as well as forwards if you take them uh, for granted or you think that somehow this change just dropped out of the sky and was an inevitable thing that just happened because time went on. It didn't. It happened because very brave people fought liberation battles to try to get civil rights and equal rights for LGBT people who were regarded as um, disordered, mentally ill, uh, um, uh, a threat to the proper functioning of society, um, people who ought to be put away um, and and I think that a lot of people took that kind of judgment on board internally and internalized homophobia is what causes an awful lot of mental health problems and also obviously family breakdown so you don't have the kind of family support mechanism so it's a sin represents that very well it it, it um, doesn't deal uh, for example with the people who got HIV from um, contaminated blood products uh, in the US including members of my own family because we have haemophilia in my family I still remember the way that people who worked with um, relatives of mine whose children had got into that situation because of haemophilia were shunned at work be like they were infectious. I mean you wouldn't believe it if you don't watch that um, drama. Um, all too often people are fearful and worried and scared and so they treat the uh, what they see as the representations of a threat as if they were a threat um, as if they're to blame for a disease that's taken hold and it causes massive amounts of extra pain so I think one of the greatest things about the health service when it does this right is that it does not judge people for the illnesses that they get unlike the tabloid newspapers. Yeah that's really powerful thank you. Um, I you uh, Sorry, I'm slightly, I'm slightly, I don't know what to say. Um, that was, really, yeah. Um, I want to sort of loop back. You were talking just then about, you know, the isolation and the family breakdown, which is something that Pedro referenced earlier um, in your first answer, I think, about mental health and loneliness. Mm -hmm. And I think we can't have an event on healthcare in 2021 without mentioning coronavirus. It is kind of the elephant mm -hmm. in the room to some extent. Um, so to Pedro, but then I think to everyone, maybe as a closing statement um, about what the impact of coronavirus has been on, on the health of our community. Um, as Angela has said, we can move, we have, it is possible to move backwards. Have we, as a community, moved backwards as a result of this crisis? Um, and what really needs to be done so that we can come out um, in the best way possible? Um, yes, yeah, so I'll go to Pedro first, and then I think I'll keep that question broad for everybody else um, to wrap up. I think in, regarding coronavirus and the sexual health, I think there's a big issue um, when it comes to loneliness. In my experience, for example, how do I um, experience my sexuality uh, during the COVID times and also during the net reach, which is the outreach online? Lots of people, uh, there is this sense of um, unsettlement like I want to have sex but at the same time I have this fear and 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 how do I cope with that you know 
can I see lots of questions that are unanswered. Um, I think the only fair way that I could answer these questions is using my own perspective and what I went through. Um, and I think it's, it's been, it's been <laughs> ups and downs for me, you know, when it comes to loneliness, not being able to see my family abroad, you know, not being able to participate in what's going on, seeing people uh, dying without being able to, to be there or to, to support the people around this person as well. So, so I think that is, that is a great impact. And I think that lots of men like me, that when, when they feel threatened or lonely, they seek for sex. And then that become very conflictuous because how do you, exp how, how do you cope? You know, your escape valve is blocked, you know? So, so I think that being able to have my peers online, you know, at the Love Tank, we always do a check-in before work and they've been very supportive. Phil, thank you, by the way. <laughs> they've been very supportive through this path for me. So being able to socialize in any aspect for me was, uh, even though it was online, I was very thankful. It was what worked for me. But you're right, there's a lot of loneliness and a lot of where, what do I do with it now? You know, where do I go from here? Yeah, completely. Um, I live by myself, so yeah, very much, very much feel the same. Um, I don't know who wants to come in next. We'll go similar question to, to all the panelists. Show, go for it. Um, so, um, I I graduated and started working early during this pandemic. So COVID has been literally my whole career and my whole clinical profession so far. I didn't so realise. But I think. Um, there's stages of pandemic. We're not the first pandemic to ever happen. And if you look at other war zones and what happens, there's clear stages that happen. You have that initial shock, you have that hope and everyone's hopes and they rally together. And we saw that at the start of the pandemic with the claps for carers, claps for carers, people are a lot nicer to you at work, that hostility at work you normally get between different different specialities disappeared. But now, now we've entered this new stage of the panic where everyone's really tired, this disillusionment. I, at work, even I've started to feel like I'm a bit of a shell. I don't feel like I'm giving my bubbly human self that I normally can give because I've just seen too much and I can't give it every time at work because it's it's like a sense of coping so the next i think the next stage of the pandemic is the hope and rebuilding and how do we get there as a society i think yes yeah, starma had a really good roadmap of developing britain a, a, a really good future of how to do that but how would you do that as lgbt people we've seen during the pandemic that career spaces have been shut and um, if we look at the art counts um, even before then if you look at 2008 to 2017 58 percent of lgbt venues were shut so what are we going to come back to when when stuff opens will we have bars and clubs to go to that we wanted to go to Do, will we have those spaces where we're allowed to be ourselves will they be there and I think we really need to make the case for these going forward when stuff reopens because that's how we that's how I met my mates that's how I interacted with loads of really interesting people doing really cool stuff and if they're not there anymore what do we do as an LGBT collective going forward well I think that goes back to the safe spaces um that Angela spoke about earlier it's always been important but particularly yeah in times of crisis and in times of stress it's even more so um I'll come to Phil next similar question on Covid but also kind of closing statements anything you want to say that you haven't said um it's hard to follow those up <laughs> <laughs> um I I wanted to say similar to show and like I think that like um as queer people I think community is so important and like, um, if we don't have those spaces to, to, I don't know, to connect with other people that are like us or to be with other people that are like us, then um, it's gonna be especially challenging coming out of this. I think um, statistically um, LG LGBT people tend to have um, poor health outcomes in general. And I think that this pandemic has probably had more of an impact on, on all of our like mental health. So it's challenging to, it's challenging to see what like what is next, particularly when we don't even know ourselves, you know, so it's it's really tricky. Yeah, definitely. Um, 
And Angela, I just want to say, I think I can speak for everyone uh, when I say that you've, it's been really inspirational to hear from you tonight. Thank you so much for coming. Um, yeah, same thing, uh, final comments, anything you haven't said. Um, yeah. My pleasure to be able to join <laughs> you for asking me. Um, obviously, coronavirus is, 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 um, is this virus that exacerbates inequalities and isolates people in fear because it stops us doing what we all do as human beings. I haven't seen, I've seen my dad who's in his mid 80s twice in the last year, apart from online. Um, it's really difficult for those who live alone. Thank goodness we've still got support bubbles so that it's not totally isolating like it was before. But for LGBT people, as has been said, our spaces, our places where we meet and set up our own different sorts of families and have our own uh, place to be ourselves have all shut down. And I actually think that a lot of the... Um, at places where LGBT employment is concentrated have been particularly badly affected by the pandemic. So hospitality, entertainment, aviation, um, it's, it's just really, really tough. And so I think we'll have to, uh, when the pandemic is over and, and at least most of the most rigid social distancing things, hopefully we will have been able to get past maybe in a year's time um we we've just got to make certain that build back better that ridiculous cliche applies to the lgbt community first before it applies to anyone else because uh, in in many cases um, those spaces are all that lots of people have yeah yeah absolutely absolutely completely agree um so on that note, actually, I will just say I saw a tweet the other day, someone saying that Donald Trump is now giving Ronald Reagan a run for his money in terms of worst handling of an epidemic ever. Mm. It's a pretty horrible uh, competition, but I think maybe there's some truth to it. I don't know. Um, thank you so much to all our panellists, uh, to Angela Show, Pedro and Phil. It's been amazing hearing from you all. Um, I think we've covered a really wide range of topics, which is really great. Um, and I think finishing on, on COVID probably is is the right way to go so thank you so much um yeah and enjoy uh, i see stephen's put a link to young fabian's uh sign up in the chat so thank you for that stephen i've already plugged our event next week on maureen calhoun so i hope to see uh, many of you there um i have looked on the sign up list and i will say from the names it seems that most of the people who've signed up are women so men on the chat please sign up um it's really important for you to come as well <laughs> um so yeah thank you very much i won't i won't uh, i won't ramble on um thank lovely to have you all all right thank you bye. thank you bye. Thank you for coming.